Greetings and good day. This is The Channeled Truth. I'm your host, Thomas Leihart, and I'm a channeler myself, and I love exploring the works of Seth and Jane Roberts, Abraham Hicks and Bashar, channeled by Daryl Anka, and other channelers as well. With me today, I have a very special guest. This is an individual who was actually there when Jane Roberts began channeling and when she held her classes, her ESP classes, as they were called in the day. And while many of you might be familiar with Abraham Hicks and Bashar and other channelers because they're very public, Seth wasn't a very public channel and neither was Jane Roberts a public person. She was very much known as an author and the Seth material primarily reached people through books. So it was very special that Barry was able to be there and actually be in the room when Jane was channeling. It's a very special, special position, right? Because it was, it was, it's so rare. And so we have him here today and he wants to riff a little bit more on reality creation. I sense this is going to be a, a favorite topic on this show. And so let's go ahead and, and ask Barry what, what, what he has to add into the mix, into the conversation. So Barry, go ahead and take it away. Here I am. Hi, everyone. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about first, because you guys last week talked about reality creation, is I just wanted to add more about reality creation. I have a few notes I, I might have to refer to. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, okay, so the first thing about reality creation is what, uh, and, and concepts like reality creation uh, interconnect with so many other, with other concepts. And you can't really understand one without, it's like plugging in the other concepts. The, the TV won't work, you know, the understanding won't work. Um, okay, so the reality creation, that's what I want to talk about or expand on. It's a thing, you know, most, uh, it's connected to all these other topics. So the first thing about reality creation that everybody, everybody knows who's into these things is that you create your own reality via your beliefs, thoughts, expectations, emotions. And through that, you attract people and events to you and um you know and then we interact we co-create with these people that we attract these events and um and this is also called i believe like the law of attraction so yes, the modern times yeah yeah and so, so that's the uh that's the usual place you go now one thing left out which is not as important as i want to get to we also create all the objects that we see so if there's five people in a, in a room, they, and they all see, they all create their own TV set to see. And via telepathy, this ongoing telepathy is going on in all reality creation, in all of life. So we all agree on what the TV is supposed to like look like, uh, where it's supposed to be in the room. And then we kind of superimpose it onto each other. So we all see one TV set and we can talk about it. Usually in like, police reports or something, that's where you get discrepancies. You know, the, the perpetrator had a mustache, no, he was wearing a t-shirt, things that you might not, might have never come up, but if you pay attention to the differences, they, 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 you can see them. Okay, so, so that's the, we create the objects and we also create the bodies that we see of the other person. We don't create the person. Now, that's what a lot of people say, or to me, too many people say, I create you. You know, when I interact with you, I'm creating you. And I say, no, you're not creating me. I'm me, you're you, we have our free will. But you are creating, if we're in person, you are creating the body that you see through telepathic agreement. And, you know, and, and that's where things like anorexia come into as a problem. You know, the person is creating for themselves, but they see in the mirror this, you know, emaciated body, but everybody else is seeing the shared, ongoing shared creation of what a body really looks like. In any case, so we do create the bodies of the other people that we see. And so that's the, uh, the uh, reality creation part. And all this is through uh, tele telepathy. Now, but what I wanted to get to was when we interact and create our own reality and interact with people, there's something called, called the pause of reflection. And this pause of reflection it can't exist without linear time. So, and the, the, the pause of reflection is according to the theory, and I feel it in, in myself, but you know, Seth uh, speaks it, is uh, before you're going to repeat a harmful act, there's like an inner tugging. 
that that saying don't repeat it don't repeat the harmful act and this process Seth and I've never heard anybody else speak to it you could ask the Illy I call him your guy about uh, um violations of natural guilt I've never the only other person I heard ever speak of it was this guy Davis from the late 1800s early 1900s in his in his words but in any case violations and natural guilt is an instinct that we have that if we harm somebody um and then we're going to do it again there's like an inner tugging that says uh don't do it it says causes uh natural guilt it doesn't doesn't mean guilty like you're a bad person you're going to be punished you, you know you didn't go to church or whatever it is so there's the uh the you know okay this pause of reflection now this ties into linear time which most people i don't know if i'd say most you know too many for me people say linear time is an illusion it's uh you know it doesn't exist but it does exist not only does it exist it's crucial to us being in physical reality in the first place and why we created physical reality remember we already had f2 you know non-physical reality we needed physical reality in part to have linear time so not only can we experience the events and react to them you know like humans do but so we could have that pause of reflection so linear time like most people when it comes say like i said i don't know most people but it's an illusion it doesn't exist well they could say that about everything about physical reality itself they could say that about the glass of water, this is a glass of water, the glass of water they're gonna have. You know, the, the, no problem taking a, put, taking a glass that doesn't exist, pouring water into it that doesn't exist, and drinking it. They don't say, ah, this doesn't exist. If I say, Tom, I wanna meet you at 1 p.m. for lunch, you don't go, what are you talking about? That's impossible. 1 p.m. doesn't exist. But when it comes to these areas of reality creation, uh, they, they say, Time, linear time doesn't exist. Okay, so it so bothers me each time I hear it because I, I so strongly know, believe that that's not the case. So well, let me just, uh, you know, something I really, uh, that really helps me put these two ideas together is this whole idea of this and that, right? So we have this sense of time is an illusion. And yes, from a higher dimensional perspective, it is an illusion because everything is simultaneous. So that's true, this but it's and that, right? So the experience of time is very real. And that's the only part of time that is real is how we experience it. The experience is real, even though the time itself is an illusion, right? So, so it's actually this and that, right? So you can be within the matrix and experience the moment to moment. The experience is real, even though it's all an illusion at the same time. Well, I believe it's both. Both are true, or the doctrine of both. Yeah, right. it's both. In, non in F2, non-physical reality as you said nothing exists anyway as it appears to be but yeah so i'm just talking now solely about physical reality and how important linear time is because it, it allows us to experience the events but more importantly i can't say more importantly equally important is it allows the pause of reflection before you repeat hurting somebody so you won't do it again and why this is so important is according to Seth of the Seth material and again I, I, I would I agree I, I wouldn't say it if I didn't agree with it um is that what I refer to as the full secret the first part is what you create your own reality uh via attraction the events and people and usually they talk about oh and you can have abundance and all the money you want which is really one just example of what you could do but the other part that is always left out is in so doing, in creating your own reality, in so doing, you ought to include helping and not harming others. The two go together in order to learn, and that is the full secret, in order, to, it's not really a secret, that's what they quote, in order to learn, in order to learn the, the two lessons you need to learn over all your lifetimes, which are those two things. You create your own reality via thoughts, beliefs, expectations, and in so doing, you are to not you are to help and not harm others, and then, according to Seth and according to but I don't know who else me, um, 
you're ready to leave the human race behind. You're ready to leave the reincarnational cycle behind and move on to other experiences, other, other realities in which reality creation is instant, it's more intense, and um, it's one other thing I can't remember right now. But uh, it's just more. So, so that's the importance of linear time Besides the both this and that, I'm talking about the this part. And that's the kind of full story about reality creation, as opposed to, you know, we, we attract people so we could uh, have lunch or get rich, something like that. No, I, I absolutely agree. It's, it's about owning the energy that we put out, right? What you put out is what you get back. And that's the idea is taking responsibility. And in a linear time format, we get to really slow things down, if that's the right term so that we can actually see the, the effect of the energy that we're putting out in this mirror reflection and physical reality. So I, I would totally agree. And I think Bashar is the only other channel where he's spoken of something similar to natural guilt, where he speaks of, of this idea that you have this, this natural inclination within you to know that you are connected to all that is and to everyone and to act in accordance with the basic compassion for all all other beings right and that when you fall out of resonance and harmony of your true natural self then you have this pang inside you have this sense of like oh i'm out of alignment i don't think i want to do that again right but it's it's like a feeling tone and that it's just there as a corrective mechanism so that next time right you're in that linear format next time you go into reality creation you remember that so it's not about like a heaviness like you said right it's not this heavy guilt you carry around with you. It's a course correction, right? It's like, okay, I'm out of alignment. Now it's time, the next action I take in this linear time space format is let's act in alignment, right? And that's all it is. And so guilt is very, it's very instructive and it's not meant to be carried around like a load of bricks, right? It's just meant to be acted on as a course corrective mechanism, right? So total, total agreement with all that. There, I'm trying to remember. It, it's a it's a crucial uh, thing. It's um, the reason and violations. It's not really viol. It's it's like nat violations and natural guilt. The violation part is violating your own nature. Yes. Of compassion and goodness. So I think you're calling that out of alignment. That's your correct. Uh, yes. 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 Okay, but. You know, so it, when you say so when you're not acting in harmony with your love, compassion, and goodness, that's the violation that triggers, um, you know, the the natural guilt, the inner tugging to not to do it. So usually, when you're not acting in harmony with that, you are hurting someone. So uh, so that's why that comes up. But also, the the one other thing I want to say with the pause, the the it also allows you to change your mind. It's not just to observe, to see, whatever. The, the time lag, the time lag of linear time allows you to observe what you're doing, you know, but more importantly, in, in the pause of reflection and out of the pause of reflection, it, since it doesn't happen instantly, you could change your mind. In this other dimension, wherever we go to, if I think, you know, I want to push Tom into a pool of water, you're, you're in the pool of water, you know. I guess it's you know, more like the dream state, sort of. But we have this chance to change our mind, both in harming other people, but in well, any, with anything. So linear right. is like a major foundation of our spiritual evolution, along with all of non, as, along with all of physical reality. But again, I'm saying most people. You could disagree, and you'd probably be right. Seem to have a hierarchy, like we're trapped in, in physical reality what we got to do is imagine it is non-physical reality we got to turn it into non-physical reality it's like something we step on to imagine this non-physical reality we got to achieve or something when it's not that at all you know in my opinion nothing 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 like that yeah i mean the paradox is you have to fully embrace the training program to go beyond it whereas i feel like most people are trying to just escape right thinking that this is some lower level based reality it's a trap it's a prison but all those are beliefs and the beliefs themselves are the prison and that's the paradox right as soon as you fall into one of these you believe it's a prison and it is a prison that's your experience right but physical reality is a brilliant divine construction to help us to 
awaken and to, and to know more and more of ourselves and to have this unique experience, right? And as soon as we acknowledge it and validate it, paradoxically, that's when we start to transcend, right? Because we're using it up for what it's meant for versus being in resistance. Oh, oh why am I here? Oh, why? Oh, time, space, reality is an illusion, right? Yeah, but it's like, it's like the spiritual bypass, like right? you're trying to skip the lesson that's right in front of you. It's like, you know, it's like that old, that old saying, it's like you're in school, you might as well take the curriculum, right? And that paradoxically is what transcends you, right? Because you, 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 you use it up, right? So I totally agreement with everything you're saying, actually. And also, it's not that difficult if you just think in terms of like playing baseball. If you're, you know, you're, you're playing baseball at, at, with your friends in the backyard, or whatever. It's real because, you know, you know, it's not real. You know, there's no such thing as, as, as a single or as a flight. You know, I mean, it's just made up rules of the game that you play and you don't dispute every single moment that's happening. So we do this all the time. And I'm, I'm relating this to, say, um, you know, forgetting the deeper truths, the expansive truths, that there really is more there. When we're in physical reality, there's a part of us that knows this isn't the whole picture. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of funny to use uh, sports as an analogy because e even from a young age, I, I, I tended to look at it that way. I, I would look at it as physical reality is just a bunch of people getting together, creating a consensus and saying, hey, let's play basketball, let's play baseball, let's play football, right? And it's just, it's a consensus reality. And yeah, there's rules. Can you break the rules? Yeah, you can break the rules, but it's, it's not relevant to the game and to the play, right? So we have these rules of physical reality, time, space, gravity, etc. And we play by the rules because that's what's relevant for the game that we chose to play, right? And that's, so I love that analogy because it really kind of harkens back to some of the original ways I started receiving these insights about reality co construction, right? There are some rules that we can't break, for example, Reincarnation, we can't not, I don't want to, I don't want to be reincarnated because I don't believe it. Uh, you know, you will be reincarnated because the deeper, stronger parts of you, soul parts of you, whatever you want to call it, believes it. And, um, you know, there's certain things you can't jump off your roof and fly to work. Certain things that you can do in the dream state, you can't do it in the physical, physical state. And those limits do exist that are agreed to before we even become physical or choose to be physical. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a consensus reality. It's like the game, right? And it's just set up that way. And granted, there's like occasionally an individual or two whose theme it is to show everybody that it is just a game, right? So they might demonstrate some, some metaphysical, you know, idea like levitation or whatnot. But I think at this point, it's, it's, it's like we're, we're going into what I like to say from third to fourth density, where these rules are becoming a little bit looser because more spiritual awareness is coming in and we start noticing like a little bit of slippage of time. We start noticing, oh, there's a parallel reality here. I can see another time track. I can get bleed-ins from parallel lives, right? So the rules are loosening up a little bit, but the rules have value. We chose them in our, when we chose to incarnate to play by the rules, right? And that becomes the theme, right? That's how I see it. It's like the soul has a theme to explore within this this matrix of rules, right? And so that's why you can't jump off the roof, right? Generally speaking, and fly, right? And physical reality. So yeah, and, and valuing the rules, right? The limitations are there so that we can have that unique experience that, you know, coming back to the sports player, right? There's only, you know, it's a unique experience if everyone was not, you know, if there was no consensus, then you wouldn't be able to have that, that potential of excellence through a certain set of rules and limitations, right? So, so yeah. Um, well, Seth referred, you know, Seth said there's a spiritual biology mm. when he talked about uh, how, you know the animals and how we have to consciously do what the animals kind of automatically do. You know, they subconsciously do it. Um, and there was there was another thing I wanted to add there. Of course, I don't remember now. I tried to write it down, but what I wrote down looks like the you know it looks like said <laughs> so I, I I can't read it. Um, but so I just, there are the things oh, about levitation. I do not believe there's anybody on this planet in front of a whole bunch of people is going to rise 10 feet off the ground. The little bit I've seen about people levitating, it's like they were hopping on their cross leg and they're hopping on their knees. It's in order to, this is what I was going to say. 
in order to do these things, to break the, the rules, like to close my hand and then actually have a penny appear, you know, not a magic trick. There's so many other rules you have to break to do that. Like with reality creation, there's so many other things attached to reality creation. There's so many things attached to breaking a rule at this level that I think it would just, reality would fall apart. You, you know, this, f, f, you know, physical reality because it's so, there's so many beliefs and so many other things connected to why you can't do it, that you can't just do it and not affect all the other beliefs around it that are, that are making it true. And anyway, that, that's how I, how I see it. And I think he's in practical operational terms. When, when Seth said, you, you know, people can't levitate, you know, he, he says this a few times, something like this in practical operational terms. And I think that that has to do with something I'm saying. He also had this thing about a pink lady. Somebody wanted to meet a pink lady or pink hair because they're having trouble with relationships. And he said, well, you know, instead of thinking of all these mythological fantasies, just figure out why you're not meeting the person you really want to meet. Um, I don't know if that's connected, but it came to my mind. As well, I, I think the whole idea is just use the consensus reality and the way it was set up instead of constantly trying to break out or, or bend the rules, right? My sense is if you really truly just channel your passion and ch channel your soul's deep creativity, whatever rules you're meant to bend, you'll just bend uh, automatically, right? And so don't worry about it. It's kind of the thing. So people are like trying to overcome and develop these metaphysical it's almost like you're you're kind of getting distracted, right? I mean, the main point is just to be our most authentic selves as truly, as deeply as we can. And that's it, right? That's the purpose, to, to translate our soul's energy into physical terms and to just be the natural, beautiful beings that we are as impeccably as we can, right? To live in accordance with that, right? It's pretty simple, right? That's at least my take on all that. If I'm being rude and probably I am, just please forgive me. But... One of the things Seth says in regard to living your life, he always says, if it's not fun, don't do it. Yeah, I totally agree. That's actually some, something, yeah, go on. Meaning to it, that it doesn't, and it has to do with you, you were talking about your authentic self or whatever, and being spontaneous. You know, be spontaneous doesn't mean do whatever you want, shoot a person, throw them out the window. But if it's not fun, don't do it. And be spontaneous means if you are, being your true self, and the closer you get to your true self, you're going to be more in touch with your innate love, compassion, and goodness. And you will choose not to harm others, and you will choose to help others because it's fun, like eating an ice cream cone is fun. So it's not just, oh, you know, yeah, do things that are fun. It's a beginning. It's how you, you begin to talk to people, but it, it has a much deeper roots. And the deeper roots is if it's not fun, don't do it is, and to be spontaneous, they go together, is the more you put that together, the more you are your authentic self, or as I would say, the more you're in touch with your innate love, compassion, and goodness. And then it is fun to help others. It's not a burden. Oh, I don't want to help this person. It's such a responsibility. That, that's not uh, the point. If, if you don't feel you, you, fun in helping others, you're going to get resentment. Why should I help this person? Why should I help anybody? Why don't they help me? Whatever you want to say. But it's the little tip of the iceberg fun that leads to this deeper thing about getting in touch and being spontaneous and getting in touch with your love, compassion, and goodness that makes helping and maybe more importantly, but both not harming people, but I guess helping both. It makes it fun to do. It is enjoyable to act in harmony with your nature. It's enjoyable, you know, to act in harmony with your love, compassion, and goodness. It's not a decision. It's not a, I, you know, like the intellectual, uh, I, I enjoy it. I'm helping this human being. You are, and that's true. But the initial explosion of joy comes from acting in harmony with your love, compassion, and goodness. And to I get to totally that, agree. To get closer to that, you have to follow the little tip of the iceberg. If it's not fun, don't do it. No, I totally, I totally agree. And once you're tapping into that pure joy, love, compassion, and passion of your soul, it's like that's the natural outcome as it overflows. You feel so full of this beautiful, vibrant joy energy that you're ecstatic. You want to help people. You enjoy the result of flowing your energy. And you find the perfect ways that are really resonant deeply with your soul of how to help people. 
you know, whether it's the healing arts, whether it's the sciences, it's teaching, playing with children, whatever it is in that moment, you know, helping somebody across the street. You do it because it overflows. You're in that love frequency and it's not something you have to think about or scheme or plan, right? Uh, there's times in our lives where, yeah, logical mind comes into play, but when you're really in that exuberant joy and when it's really fun, you overflow with goodness and compassion and it just makes your life so rich and so juicy. And it's not, you know, I'm doing it and I resent it, right? That is such a different vibrational frequency. And that's coming from a place of lack, right? You feel, you know, you feel burdened, you feel lack, you don't have enough energy. Oh, they should be helping me instead, right? But it's, it's that profound shift to, to, and it is fun, right? And so I just want to bring in, because Bashar's formula of passion is just so perfect for this, you know, act on your passion to the best of your ability, take it as far as you can with no insistence on the outcome, right? And stay in a positive state, regardless of what's happening, right? That right there is, is what Seth talked about. You know, if it's not fun, don't do it, right? And investigate what negative belief, you know, if it's not fun, well, Maybe, I'm, maybe my negative beliefs are making it not fun, or maybe I'm trying too hard, or maybe I'm trying to go in a direction that's not in alignment with who I truly am, right? So there's such, it's such a juicy, this whole, this whole concept, this whole idea of reality creation, right? Because it's so, it's so much not from the mind, right? It's from that pure space of joy, love, and compassion. Okay, I wanted to say two things I hope I remember. One is, uh, I, don't, I wasn't trying to say, you know, when you're in this this state, you're calling this, you know, wondrous, joyful, whatever state, which I agree with that part. But it's not like you're always in it. It's it, it gets triggered when you want to help, when, when you, somebody is in need or, you, or somebody you want to help, somebody you don't want to hurt someone or you want to help someone. It's like that you're not wandering around in this kind of, you know, state. And then somebody wanders into you. And now in my great state, I'm now going to help you. I think it just it, it naturally comes up. So you could you could be you know trying to fix your car, which I can't do at all, uh, and I would uh, you know. But you could be trying to fix your car, and you're, you're annoyed at it for whatever other reasons. And then someone comes around, and they need directions. That is when it would come up in, in the way I'm I'm thinking about it. So you you switch out of trying to fix my car and whatever beliefs and annoyances are with that, but it would now open up, trigger this whole feeling of innate love, compassion, and goodness. This is where. This is when it comes up, you know, like a flower doesn't grow on the sidewalk without, you know, not the crack. It doesn't grow in thin air. It grows in dirt. And this this feeling grows, for, it exists, but it grows, it flowers, it comes into view when somebody, uh, you know, needs help. I mean, you could have it all the time anyway, but I wasn't trying to say this kind of state, you're walking around with this just joyous kind of feeling all the time. And um, I want to say one other thing, because I'm going to forget it. And I don't know how other people can remember everything, but I got so much, and, and I'm writing it down. I'm trying to, but it's coming out like this. Seth also said he uses the word fun because he thought people would think of the word joy as too like serious and too, I don't know, deep or too spiritual. So really fun and joy are, are synonyms. So if it's if it's not joyful, don't do it, which sounds a little bit better if it's not, not better, different. And if you say it's not fun, don't do it. But fun implies more of a, to me, more of a surfacey thing. Oh, you know, if it's not fun, don't do it. Sometimes things aren't fun because they're horrible. You know, they shouldn't be fun. Uh, shouldn't be, I'll put in quotes. You know, like it's not fun, I don't know, punching somebody in the nose. Or it's not fun being around a person who's saying things you don't want, you know, you don't like. Or, you know, you know what I mean. There's a lot of things that aren't fun. So that is really no question. Don't do it. If it's not fun, don't do it. But in these other areas we're talking about, the, the same theory or philosophy or whatever it is, if it's not joyful, don't do it. If it's not fun, don't do it. But as I, as I was saying, that is why that leads you to be in your authentic self. That leads you into being in harmony with, in touch with, and then have the chance to act in harmony with your love, to consciously act in harmony with your love, compassion, and goodness. Uh, and that's why fun is so important. Not It doesn't exist as a little nugget. You know, here it is. If it's not fun, don't do it. That's over here. And this other belief, this is over here. And this one's over here. They are all connected. Is kind yeah. of and I feel like it taps into that sense of spontaneity, right? Because we get, we get so mental, right, in our culture.
but the whole idea of fun you kind of tap into the sense of okay there's something spontaneous about it it arises like you said somebody asks for something and you feel this joy welling up for hey I, I, I can do that right I'm skilled at that hey let me help you out right and so and to, to your other point well we're in third density right transitioning to fourth density to higher level physical reality right and the idea is yeah at this point uh, we still have a lot of negative beliefs, right? So we're not always walking around in joy, love, and compassion. But the, the, the beauty of these teachings from Seth and from Bashar and other channelers is we have the tool to transform that. Many tools, right? Follow the feeling back to the belief, right? What would I have to believe is true about myself, about my reality to feel this particular way? Or to, have, you know, to experience resentment, let's unpack that. Or for me to not want to help this person, well, what's the negative belief? Oh, I believe in lack, right? I don't have enough. I can't help this person because I feel like I don't have enough. I'm not getting enough, right? So you can always follow it back. If it's not fun, don't do it, right? But well, you can always investigate, well, why isn't it fun? Am I, ma am I making it not fun? Or is this just out of alignment? You mentioned obviously punching someone in the nose is not fun, right? It could be spontaneous, but coming from anger, right? So there's definitely some things that are just not in that vibration because obviously they're out of alignment with who you are. But sometimes something would be exciting and fun and joyful, but you've got these negative beliefs that are like, oh, I'm afraid. Oh, if I go into public speaking, everyone will make fun of me, so I better not. Like, that doesn't sound like fun at all. But then we can investigate, right? We have to be really aware. Why isn't that fun? right? Is it because it's out of alignment with our true natural self? Or do I have a bunch of negative beliefs here that I need to unpack and undo, right? So that's just another aspect of these teachings that's just so beautiful and so rich that we have the tools to transform through that. Being spontaneous again, that's the pause of reflection. I want to punch somebody in the nose. And then you have that pause of reflection because of linear time. Do I really want to do it? Uh, for getting into the deep, deep thoughts about your own beliefs, you know, just do I want to do it? Because you do have the natural guilt that that the violations of natural guilt always in operation. And um, oh, I was going to say something else about being spontaneous, and I didn't want to interrupt you because I want to appear to be a nice person, which I am really. Um, like, oh yeah, this is what it is when you you have to trust yourself that you'll be okay, because a lot of people think they're bad, people are bad. So spontaneity means chaos and violence. If everybody just does what they want, we will kill each other. You know, again, that's a belief, obviously, but it, it's, it stems from not, not, not trusting yourself in, as a person. If I act spontaneously, I will do bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Act spontaneously, and I always have to watch myself. Because if I don't watch myself, I'm going to get into trouble and I'm going to do wrong and bad things, all tied to pretty strong beliefs that people have. But being spontaneous ultimately and doing what's fun ultimately and trusting yourself uh is what leads you out of the reincarnational cycle it leads you to leave the human race behind uh if there's x, x amount of lifetimes and probable lifetime probable selves dream out you know all that's connected uh, you know what you, one of the things you guys were saying in the other thing was you know the infinite amount of probable realities you have but what you weren't saying was each of those infinite probable realities create their own infinite probable realities as they're making decisions. So it's not just our infinite number of probable realities, multiply that, square that by an infinite number of probable realities that each of those infinite probable realities, each one of them are creating each moment in their moment. So this expanding universe to me is the manifestation uh, in some way of all these ever expanding incredible numbers of probable realities and then add to that dream realities because we would have dream realities and a person in our dream has his own dreams and he would have his and then and then those people would have theirs so you got dream realities probable realities our quilt of our reality which is a quilt of different probable realities sort of so it's just an amazing expansion much more as amazing as it is that we create infinite number of probable realities based on what we're doing in the universe it's just I I totally agree. I mean, there's only so much you can touch into in one episode, but absolutely. It's like that infinity, right? We say the word infinity. We sometimes don't really grok what that really means. And so you just did a fine job of helping us see just what a tremendous 
amazing multi-dimensional crystal of creation with all these reflections within reflections within reflections right the dreamer within the dream dreams right and and all these realities and, and it really is infinite right so that's a beautiful beautiful way of, of seeing that and, and and feeling how magical of a universe that we live within right even though infinity is infinity by definition there's somehow this i don't know may have these things but there has to be more infinity than than infinity meaning yes we create infi infinite uh, probable realities that's it that's infinity but if each single one of those probable realities on their own independent of us each one is creating their infinite number of probable realities you have an infinite number of probable realities creating an infinite number of probable realities each one of them and I don't know that somehow is different than just I'm creating an infinite a number of probable realities in my focal personality life did you see what I mean even though infinite no, I totally I totally agree it's like you're you're, you're slowing this down and, and really helping helping this this grokking of this idea of infinity right because we say it in passing but we don't always think about what that really means right so so yeah you're, you're expanding that and helping us to see what does multi-dimensionality and infinite reality really mean so yeah thank you for that so barry we're coming up on the time here so thank you so much for being here i feel like we barely scratched the surface here you have something to add yeah yeah sorry really i am sorry uh to each one of them we're one of their probable realities that's all i wanted to say we're one of their inv invisible probable realities as they're one of our as they're our invisible probable reality that's all sorry yes and so this is another episode we can tap into on parallel realities and we could probably do several episodes on that as well right so thank you so much for being here we'll definitely have you back on the show because there's only so much you can cover out of infinity in a 35 minute episode so Thank you for being here. And for those of you that are watching, may this help inspire you to be more of your true natural selves. May you find that joy, love, compassion, and express it in all you do. And may you use these teachings that are available to transform from negativity to light, from darkness to light, limitation to freedom. So with that, we're signing off and we will see you next time.